Um, welcome again. I'm Gina Turnage. I'm with Hypothesis. I am the account manager for um, the state of California, and I have with me Cara Jarrett, who is our director of marketing, and we have a special guest, Lynn Serwin from Cerritos College, who will be sharing her experiences a little bit later. But again, if you have any uh, questions, please use the Q&A. Cara is going to be monitoring that to answer any questions and let me know if I need to pause. Uh, this is an interactive or a small group, so please just jump in whenever you um, have a question. So I just wanted to give a little short history lesson about Hypothesis. So we were founded um, well over 10 years ago as a nonprofit organization. Our CEO and founder, he realized there was a wealth of information spread across the web, but there was no way to comment and collaborate without moving to a closed platform. I'm sure you guys can, under can remember that. In other words, you have to take the conversation elsewhere. So for eight years, he worked to define the Web3 standard that would unlock this opportunity, and that result is the Hypothesis product. This was his goal to build a new infrastructure, connecting people to ideas, so like Google Docs, but everywhere. And this is where we are today. So all this work led up to here. Um, we have over 300 institutional partners, 1.9 million users, 2 million content sources, 52 million plus annotations. And you can see the growth from 2017 to 2023 has been phenomenal. And when I first started, I've been with Hypothesis for almost three years, but I've been in the higher education space for probably 25 years. Um, this slide was, I could read all of the uh, schools, but now uh, we're happy to say that they're kind of small, but these are all the, the schools that use us um, across North America. But more importantly, these are the schools than California who are our partners. So this is definitely a combination of two-year schools and uh, four-year universities. So we're so happy to be partnering in California. And the reason we're here is to let you know too that we have a uh, agreement with College Buy. So if you go to the College Buy website, you can click on um, the link and you can see we're here. So this will make, I think, implementation um, very much easier for your school that we've already been um, review, a security review approved. So we're good to go. But I just wanted to let you know that we're um, we're there. If you do a search or anyone internally that you work with does a search, we are at the website. And this, the College Buys, obviously you guys probably know what uh, College Buys does, but we, we are offering um, some discounted pricing for um, all the community colleges in California and also the AICCU group. Car, any questions before I forge ahead? No, it doesn't look like anyone's asked any in the Q&A yet. Okay, perfect. So we think Hypothesis does three things really well. Um, it makes reading active. So like I said, I've been doing this a long time and I've, I've never seen a way that you can see or hold students accountable for engaging in some content, um, you know, quizzes, homework, that comes after, but how do you get them to actively engage with the content and with each other? And Lawrence says it here. He said that hypothesis delivers on the promise of social and of digital annotation. It also makes reading visible. So again, um, I've talked to faculty for for many years, and uh, students don't read seems to come up uh, pretty consistently. So how do you get a visual or visibility into what students? understand, don't understand, have they even engaged? Um, so hypothesis and social annotation makes reading visible to you and also makes reading visible um, for the students as a peer-to-peer -peer learning environment. This is my favorite. It makes reading social and collaborative. So I know we're coming out of the post-pandemic haze, but um, for a time, you know, we weren't, we weren't, we, we were trying to build community, right? We were trying to be included in the conversation and it's, and trying to adjust to just being online. So um, Shannon says that she thinks kind of hypothesis as her um, literary Facebook. And then when she doesn't understand something, she can reach out and say, am I crazy? Or does anybody else not understand this? And somebody else can jump in and help or say yes. 
Um, it's a good way to give all your students a voice. Everybody's included, they, they belong, they can all join the conversation, especially those shy ones that sometimes don't speak in the face-to-face -face environment. Um, social annotation gives them a space to also be included in the conversation. And we've been, they, our LMS app has been around now for well, three, four plus years. So we definitely are starting to get some uh, case studies, some data, some proof uh, about social annotation and how it improves retention, um, engagement. Um, so we, we think that there's a three-way value proposition. Teachers, um, you can, like I said, engage to see if the students did the reading or they're struggling or what you need to address what did they skip that's also you know like i need to address that um for schools as far as um retention you know persistence and then students you know they get to have conversations with their peers and you know you can be sort of let them be the center of authority and you can facilitate that facilitate that conversation and they will engage with each other and just a case in point, um, this is a recent case study we post we uh, uh, published from UT Austin in um, a physics, a big physics course, which is sort of that intro course that's probably tough for a lot of students. And um, we had two cohorts. We had a non-social annotation hypothesis use a cohort, and then we had the hypothesis cohort, and those assignments were as some of my faculty call it, essayed, so social annotation reading assignments. And you can see just by the graph, as you typically have, the students really engage the first, you know, week or so of the of the class, and then it just drops off. But the students who were engaged in social annotation, you can see they persisted um, throughout the semester, probably spiked during more test days, and they were probably five times longer engaged in the content than the students who were not um, using social annotation. And this is what, I love this because like I said, I've been doing this a long time. I've worked with some, a lot of technology. And when I saw hypothesis and sort of the, the ease of implementation, uh, I was just thrilled. And I'm going to show you what it looks like in Canvas so you can see it, but these are just some screenshots that it makes your course documents and uh, websites annotatable with a single sign-on. Um, we added this new feature, which has been highly waited for, where you can annotate YouTube video transcripts so you can have conversations in the margins while you're watching a video um, and have conversations. And in speed, uh, Canvas, SpeedGrader is awesome. So you can uh, grade uh, the student's engagement in the assignment in SpeedGrader. So you can see how it sets up with the, the reading assignment. I see Jennifer's interaction with, um, the, with the content and with her peers, and I can give her a grade, give her some feedback. I can use rubrics if I want, and I can easily scroll to the next student or drop down to the next student. And also you can use group sets in your Canvas and you would set those up prior. So if you want to create more intimate uh, reading conversations on the same reading assignment, or if maybe you're doing a, a project and each, each group is doing a different project, or maybe you wanna have groups of one because you're doing some one-on-one -on -one, uh, work with the students, then you would use that in Canvas. So what can you annotate? PDFs, definitely number one source is PDFs, and especially in Canvas. Most of um, you all have all of your assignments in Canvas files already. So it's just a matter of creating an assignment and laying a hypothesis over your already established reading assignment. Um, also open textbooks, OER, so anything public facing on the internet or downloadable. Web pages and online articles, those would need to be again open source, so not behind like a paywall or a login and password. For example, the New York Times, if you wanted to use an article from the New York Times, you would want to create a PDF that targeted a reading. Um, and as I mentioned, YouTube video transcripts. And if your school subscribes to JSTOR, you can also grab the stable URL of any content that your school subscribes to in JSTOR, which I'm sure your library will love that because that's great sort of data and uh, analytic use. 
And if you're an independent vital source school, we also have the ability to lay over uh, vital source e-text contents and articles. And annotating is multimodal. So not only is it a threaded discussion, um, so you're anchoring the conversation in the content versus those discussion boards that you know are a little bit esoteric. Um, so you can um, annotate textually with images, equations with LaTeX, videos, links, tags, emoji. So it really is more of a multimodal um, experience. Is there a question? Yeah, so it looks like there's two questions. Can you use it on eBooks? And could you use it on TED Talks from the TED Talks website? Whoops. So if the TED Talk website has the transcript that's accessible and is public facing, yes. And the same with an e-text is if it's public, maybe a Libra text or um, something that's open stacks that's open or content that's open, yes. Vital source, if you're if we can turn that on, you can use it over vital source. Um, because hypothesis comes to the reading, it's not part of the sort of account creation and relationship. We have to be able to lay over content. Um, so I think that would just depend on where you're getting your your textbook content from. And we're working on expanding that so that we can lay over more e-text and also Lynn and I were talking about campus pages so we're working on the campus pages where you could grab a campus page and perhaps that's where some of your textbook content could live as well does that answer your question what if an ebook that the library bought copies of I'm curious because I use these quite a bit in my classes so that's from Sarah Kirby it seems like, and Lynn may be able to clarify this too, but it seems like if the library has purchased it, either you could, if it's part of JSTOR, for one thing, I know you can grab the textbook, oh, wait, the, the URL for that. If it's outside of JSTOR and it's with some other subscription, I'm not 100% sure. You might have to create PDFs of targeted readings from the textbooks and not the entire because you really you really wouldn't want them annotating the entire textbook anyway. You really do want to lead and guide them to what you want them to engage in instead of just assigning the whole textbook. But maybe Lynn can address that from her perspective yeah. when, when she shares. Oh, yeah, you, can, you go ahead. want me to answer it then? Yeah, yeah, please. Or now. No, now. Good. Yeah. Okay. Please. Yep. Uh, two things. One, I have used um, Hypothesis with the TED Talk transcripts. That works great on a TED website. Um, and two, as with regard to your library, um, purchasing and providing text to you, are they providing it to you in a PDF? Because if they're providing it to you in a PDF, you could just use the PDF. If they're providing it to you in some way, because it is available to your students through your library. You can copy those portions, put it in a PDF, and then um, put it to um, Hypothesis. The only thing is, this is something I'm learning with my um, new role as ZTC uh, lead, <laughs> is that you need to make sure that you add the link to your library source um, in a PDF if you're taking just a portion of that source that um, shows that you have the copyright covered. Sounds very similar to like the JSTOR integration we have where you're grabbing that stable URL. Yeah, nice, perfect. Good questions. I love those questions. Anything else, Cara? Uh, so it looks like Farrah responded. She said, it is not provided as a PDF, but I suppose I could place those book chapters in a PDF. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Okay, good. I think we're good. All right, so let me get out of my slideshow. If I can figure out how to get out of my slideshow. Oops, nope, I don't want to do that. <clears throat> all right. So hopefully you all can see my hypothesis um, course. Should look familiar to you. Should look familiar from your student's perspective. So the great thing is, again, Hypothesis is not a platform. It's an external tool that works within the workflow of Canvas. So it never takes your students outside of Canvas. It doesn't take them to another platform and bring them back in. It doesn't sync the grades. The grades automatically flow from SpeedGrader into your gradebook. 
So we are very particular about, about privacy concerns and we only um, capture student names and the courses they're in. We don't market to students. We don't accept pay, you know, pay from student, things like that. So if that's important to you, um, then, then it aligns with, um, with our, our strategy. So the student would come into their assignment. They would click on the assignment that you've created for them. In this situation, this is this is an open education resource textbook on chemistry. So these are my directions. So I've given my students some uh, directions, some assignment details, and I'm sure Lynn can talk about that. But I, from what we hear, you really do need to get be kind of explicit, especially in the beginning. Like, what do you expect from them? What does this mean? Um, because I don't know that a lot of students have experience annotating or reading and annotating. So you really want to be a little bit more probably specific, or maybe you do prompts within your annotation to let them know what's expected. And I've also heard you see the stronger students will sort of model behavior too for the students who don't know. So they'll see what their colleague, their peers are doing, and then they'll go, oh, okay, that's what that is. So really good um, assignment details are helpful. And we have a lot of help. We have a customer success team and they've created sample assignments, starter assignments. We have faculty who have graciously uh, shared their assignments and different disciplines with different pedagogical um, goals in mind that you can get started. So we're not expecting you to reinvent the wheel or start from scratch. So once they read through their instructions, they would click on this link. You'd want to make sure that when you're creating the assignment, you, you're loading in a new tool to give them as much real estate on the page. And hopefully you saw that hypothesis shelf kind of rolled over um, as I turned it on. So here is my reading assignment. This is, a, like I said, an OER textbook, and here is hypothesis. So hypothesis lays over the reading assignment, as I mentioned earlier, and the student can close it. If they want to just read a clean copy, they can also click this little button here if they really don't want to see any other annotations before they start to join the conversation. And you can see it's a threaded discussion. So it is anchoring, like our discussion boards, anchoring the discussion in the context of the reading, right? Instead of like outside of the reading. Um, so you can see I can annotate. There's a YouTube video, as I mentioned, multimodal. There's images. Um, there's no limit to the amount of threaded discussion I can have. So I can, you know, to respond, there's no um, number. So the amount of threaded discussion is unlimited. So once I post it, you can see I've responded. But to get started, so the students can start annotating, um, they're going to read through their um, document. And when they're ready to join the conversation, they're going to click on the, the text they want to talk about. They can highlight. So highlighting is that private act, you know, that we've been doing forever on eText for, for self-study, um, not to be shared with you or their peers. Um, but annotate is where the collaboration starts. So you can see once I let go of that, there's my name. There's the text I'm going to talk about, annotate, and then here's my text box. And then you can see across the top, I've got bolding, italics, parentheses. I can, this is where I can do my YouTube video or maybe a link to another article. Um, maybe this document doesn't do a good job of explaining the structure of DNA. And my, my colleague, my fellow student wants to post in a YouTube video saying, this makes more sense to me. I can post that there. Images, as you saw already in the post, LaTeX, Bruni equations. So I would start typing my response here. And then I could tag it. So tagging is just a way to search for topics um, or by student name, you can search as well. So I can tag it, kind of like a Google search. If I'm not ready to share at the class yet, I can say only me, not ready to share, but it's important that they know they can't do only me if they do want to share with the class. I know that comes up once in a while where a student says, I not showing up because they, they only posted it to themselves. So once I'm ready to share with the class, I click on that and then you can see here's my annotation. As the owner of the annotation, only I can edit or delete it, um, but anybody can now reply to it. And then there is some searchable, like I said, in this box, I can search my tags, I can search by student name, I can move uh, annotations up and down, maybe the maybe I want the newest ones on top. And also, if you have new annotations, and you're in, in here, a little red circle will show up, which tells you I think you've got new annotations. Um, <clears throat> this is our support 
ticket button so students can contact support directly from here. We don't expect you to be tech support. And but um, as I mentioned earlier, there's very minimal tech support needed usually from what I've seen. Um, and then you can also talk to support as well. Is there a question? So it looks like Shannon has asked, is tagging accomplished using a taxonomy or is it more like a folks on folks anonymy organically generated by each user? I'm going to let Lynn answer that, but here's my understanding. You can have them text by say, um, I've heard some faculty say, if you have a question for me, type in the word question or my name. So I'll know you have a question for me, or maybe you're annotating a poem and um, I need to see you show me tone, imagery, diction, and I need you to tag it so that I know you know what that means. Um, and those are ways to search, but certainly by topics, by vocabulary. I mean, I think, um, Lynn, do you have any feedback on that? I actually am not familiar with either one of those terms in, in terms of what she's asking, but it works the same way that tagging works in social media with a hashtag. So you yeah. just hashtag any word and then you search for that word and whatever hashtags have that word will come up. So I have even... used, go ahead, sorry. I have used tags to have my students find me and find my um, uh, annotations in the text because a lot of times I'll make an annotation that has a question that I want them to answer and respond and we have a conversation under my annotation so I use it for that I don't do you have to do the hashtag though because I think you can just type in the word do you have yeah to it's just the word but it works like that it works like a hashtag I'm yes saying. exactly exactly yeah So it's is pretty that what either one of those words mean? Yeah. <laughs> what were those words again? I got to look those up. Taxonomy. Are, what were those words again? Taxonomy and folksonomy. So I know taxonomy. Taxonomy, Lim's, I know. Bloom's okay. taxonomy, but I don't know folksonomy. I don't know the other one either. Hmm. I can imagine you could use Bloom's taxonomy verbiage or a word um, so the students know what, what is this word. Yes, I think you probably could. Is there another question? Uh, yeah, so I think Shannon's clarifying folksonomy is social tagging, not pre-established lists or sets of tags. It's social tagging. They yeah. can tag whatever they want. Yeah. Yes. So you can see, they can tag. You can set the what tags you want them to use specifically. If you're if you're if it's targeted for you, like you're trying to figure some, you want some information. If you want them to just tag on their own, you know, based on what you've mentioned, then certainly they can just tag on their own. So I think there's any way, you know, you want to use the the tagging feature. It's possible. We we actually do a workshop on tagging in multimedia. But anyway, yeah. So I wanted to show you what it looks like in SpeedGrader so that you can just see how great it is to give your students some feedback. You saw it on the, um, the screenshot, so it looks definitely looks the same. And I do think SpeedGrader has the best grading functionality of the LMSs. So this was the screenshot that I showed you earlier with Jennifer. So here is the, the reading assignment. Here's Jennifer's engagement her annotations and how she replied and, and talked to her, her colleague, her peers. You can annotate right here as well. If you wanna, you know, join, add anything to that. Um, and then you would pop over here, give her a grade, give her a comment, hit submit, and then easily scroll to the next student or maybe use the drop down and find your students that way. Um, so it just makes the grading, the grading a little bit more concise and efficient, I think. So does anybody want to see how we create an assignment or is that of any is that of any interest to anyone on the call on the Anybody responding Cara? No, I think I think we can just keep moving forward. Okay. Okay, perfect. All right, Lynn, well, I'm so glad you've been here because um, 
You have great feedback. Uh, so I'm going to let you take it away and share some of your other experiences with hypothesis and social annotation in your courses. Okay. Well, thank you so much again for asking me to come and speak with everyone. I'm curious, uh, are the participants here primarily faculty or are you um, uh, instructional designers, IT, admin? Who is here? I took a look and it looks like we have a healthy mix of faculty and um, admin instructional designers. Okay, great. Um, because my experience is primarily as a instructor uh, using the tool, but I also uh, am part of the distance education team and help bring the tool to the campus. So I can address that a little bit as well. Um, okay, so I have been teaching English at Cerritos College for 30 years. And I started teaching online in 1999, like way back in the Stone Ages when it was completely different than it is now. So I've watched a lot of evolutions of technology come through. Um, and I've taught, you know, in person, hybrid, and completely online, all levels of composition and um, some short story fiction. So as that professor, I always struggle with students doing the reading um, and trying to replicate in an online environment that kind of um, classroom environment you get when you jigsaw a reading, which is breaking it up into pieces and having small groups talk about it. Hypothesis really allows for you to replicate that uh, group, small group reading experience or a jigsaw in the online environment. It is really exciting to get students to engage in the reading in a way that um, just assigning the reading and giving them a discussion board doesn't do. Uh, and it's more engaging than a Google Doc um, because it is, um, it, well, if you are doing it on the web, uh, Hypothesis is available as a as a, pl a plugin on the web. You could, you know, and I was thinking I could just have my students all make their own accounts, but it's the Canvas interface that makes the biggest difference. The Canvas interface is invaluable to um, to having your students engage with your reading in a more um, effective way. Uh, because they don't have to leave Canvas. It is all right there. And that is huge. Um, uh, as the DE coordinator for student engagement and success, part of my role was to research tools that would be helpful to help students engage. And Hypothesis I found in the spring of 2021. And I, um, I wanted to try it. It actually got, I think I got some outreach from Hypothesis connected with me and said, we, we see you have it, but there's only like one professor using it. I'm like, we have it. <laughs> I didn't even know. So uh, evidently, our one of our political science professors had um, contacted Hypothesis, and they gave him a trial. Well, he didn't tell me. He didn't tell the DE team. Like, nobody knew it was there. So as soon as I got involved, then we really started rolling it out to the campus. And we went from that one user in 2021 to... Um, I forget how many users we have now. I think I looked it up. Um, almost 2,700. So that's pretty exciting in, in a, two, what, two and a half years. Um, I primarily teach English 100, which is the composition course, but I also teach English 100 with the co-rec, the, um, co-requisite composition course. And I'm teaching that online, 100% online, which it gives unique challenges. There's a unique challenge to teaching that class uh, online. And the more I have my students engage with each other and with the content, the more successful they are. They um, are, they need, the whole purpose of that co-requisite support course in English and freshman comp is to provide that extra support or the just-in-time remediation that the students need. And Hypothesis really allows me to do that, both with um, reading and then also with skills development. I can have them work on a, um, a worksheet together or a directed learning activity together. Um, any way to get them working together 
because a lot of students in that class in English 100 as well, and this may be true across all campuses, uh, there are students who do not have any confidence in themselves. And they do not, they want to make sure they're doing it right before they do any kind of submission because they are worried that um, getting it wrong means that they're not learning, which is exactly the opposite of we know to be true. So there's a huge disconnect between what they think learning is and what we think learning is. And hypothesis allows that kind of muddy gray area for them to be able to um, practice low stakes. Very, very good for that. Um, so I, I'll get back to you know what I do when we get into the Q&A at the end and after the results, but I wanted to talk a little bit about how we implemented Hypothesis on our campus. One of the things that we really like about it is that it is accessible and it's secure. We have a universal technology task force at our campus that has to vet all of the um, uh, external tools that get integrated into Canvas and um, Hypothesis passed with flying colors. They have all of the accessibility um, tools in place. Uh, you, they have an OCR tool where you're able to take your PDF and run it through the OCR. It's, you know, fallible. There are problems with all of those OCR tools and unclear PDFs, but, um, but it's, it's available uh, to you, whereas just asking your students to read a PDF that you've just put in your class is not accessible. So that is going to run you into trouble. And this helps avoid that. Um, okay. So the pain points that we all have uh, is our students not reading. That is the number one problem, I think, that we see in in-person, hybrid, online, remote, all classes. Um, or in my case, I found that students were not able to perform certain parts of the writing process because they hadn't done the learning through the lesson that was the reading. Um, I have minimal or zero engagement of students connecting to each other with reading when it is just simply assigned, which is what I did for years. I think a lot of us have done this for years. Read chapter one, you know, page 32, 31, and be prepared to discuss it in class next time. And if you're familiar with reading apprenticeship out of uh, um, UC California or Cal State East Bay reading apprenticeship program, you know that that is um, an ineffective way to help your students to learn to read and to understand how the reading is uh, connected to writing or whatever else uh, you're teaching. So hypothesis allows us to um, kind of bring that visibility that Gina was talking about before. So I really, I really like that for, in, and the social aspect, the, the comment where it said, this is um, like my Facebook, I can ask. I find this to be invaluable with those less confident students that they are able to see how someone else approached it. The confident students are gonna get in there first they make the annotations. It just opens the door for those shy, introverted ones who do not want to do this on their own and get it wrong. Um, if you are uh, using reading outside of an assignment, and then you're asking students to discuss it in a discussion board that's low stakes or has no points attached to it, um, the likelihood of them engaging with that is pretty low. But because hypothesis integrates with assignments, it can be a discussion assignment or a submission assignment. Either way, they um, are able to uh, fulfill a requirement of the course, which pretty much all students will engage with something that's a requirement in the course. So all of my reading gets... Um, some level of low stakes credit. And the results, the benefits. Um, Hypothesis has a wealth of resources for you as a subscriber. This has been invaluable for us. We get a um, concierge type service um, support person who we can contact directly. 
that person can also provide training for your campus. Um, they have a fantastic resource um, website or series of websites. It's it's a, like a repository of of work uh, site um, case studies and assignments and all kinds of things. You want to just try it. You can ha to have your students annotate your syllabus. There's a syllabus assignment and it's already made for you on the hypothesis support services. So those are huge. Um, I'm glad uh, you mentioned that <laughs> non-academic content because I was going to add to all of your you don't have to just annotate academic content. I mean, yeah. study guides to help students prepare for a test, project instructions to make sure they understand what the project entails, the syllabus to make sure they know, you know, what are they excited about? What are they worried about? When's the first test? Um, lecture notes or lecture slides. I mean, anything you want to see if they're engaging and reading, you put a lot of work into all those resources mm -hmm. and then just to sit over there to the left and nobody touches it. Now you can actually use those resources too to engage the students in there and see that they've actually engaged in all that hard work that you, you know, put in. And what Gina just said earlier about how hypothesis is going to start, um, uh, supporting campus pages. Oh my God. Like that's going to be amazing because then I'll be able to have my students annotate their understanding of the, I mean, just a simple, quick, here's what I get. Here's what I don't get muddiest point, whatever it is. That way, then I know what I need to do in order to make sure those, um, instructions are crystal clear, which for me, uh, teaching that co-requisite course is paramount importance. Um, okay, so our discussion boards were so flat. I don't know about you, but I have taken millions, not millions, I guess, tens of classes <laughs> online where um, we're told to read it, um, something in a discussion board and comment on it and comment on other people's posts. That is the most flat, soul-sucking activity known to man in the online learning world. I, I hate it. it. It seems irrelevant too, right? Yeah, and I know that it's it's we do it that way, and it, it it in theory it's a fantastic way. It's just when there's a better tool, we can use a better tool. Yeah. Um, so instead of going with a kind of flat discussion board like that, you can use hypothesis to kind of break it up to have certain groups, especially with the group function. You can have certain groups answer certain types of questions. That way, then the whole class has the entire reading, but they have the analysis from each group so that those can be then um, compared or contrasted in another discussion board later on. It's like having small groups in the classroom and then reporting out as a large group. So um, I love it for that. Um, let's see. Uh, we're seeing a lot more deeper engagement and reading comprehension. Um, our numbers are really great. I just met with Gina this week and she gave me some data that shows that we have um, well, now almost thirty six have... almost thirty six thousand student engagement touch points from July first to yesterday. Yeah, thirty six thousand ways that students have engaged online through this tool since With each other July. And the content. Yep. I mean that's that's a a phenomenal. If we were to compare that to the students who are really truly engaging in a discussion board, I know those numbers, it's just not, there's not really a big comparison there. And I know most of the faculty who I've talked to who are using this tool, they are using it um, with multiple questions that they're asking their students. So they have to do multiple um, annotations in each reading, which helps them to engage in it more. It's not just find one thing that strikes you, talk about it, and then respond to somebody else who has something like that. It's a little more engaged in that, like Gina showed us in the example. Yeah, we're not we're not accepting the me too, I agree comments. <laughs> <laughs> it's not Facebook, it's not really Facebook. <laughs> the other thing that's really exciting about our campus is that in 2023, we now have one, two, three, four, five, like 12 departments who are actively using hypothesis, including 
cosmetology, automotive, uh, Spanish, um, and geology. Those are not, you know, this is tailor-made for English. Like the English department is probably the most active, but uh, automotive, geology, these are these are big deals. And we're and Hypothesis has great tools to help you engage your STEM faculty. Um, so we're working on that, trying to get some more of our uh, math and and um, chemistry faculty using it a little bit more. Well, I just can't. Um, I mean, we're yeah. doing this for so long. There's not one course area where you don't expect students to read something or engage in something. Now, I, don't, I can't think of one course where it's like, no, we don't read in this course. There's just not, whether it's articles, um, journals, things like that. You're expecting students to engage in some sort of reading or whatever in pretty much every course, even math, because you want them to slow down and read how to do the work, the equations before they just jump to the homework, right? Like, so I just can't think of any course I've ever worked with a faculty on where you didn't want them to read something. And this is also something that you can take back to your campuses as a way to engage your students in the Learning Career Pathways program. Because I know that we're all, I think we're all from California Community Colleges. Is that right? Yeah. So the uh, Learning Career Pathways is our um, a, a really strong initiative that we're working on in California right now. And um, having hypothesis connected to these uh, areas helps students to be exposed to um, readings and activities in these areas in ways that they might not be. We now at Cerritos are working on some contextualized classes, and these contextualized classes are going to connect to the LCPs. And so we may connect, we may have an English freshman composition class for automotive students. In fact, we've done this before. And in that, they will have specified reading. They will have like instruction manuals or any industry standards, um, things like that, that they will be able to socially connect over in a way to better learn their understanding. Um, so that's that's exciting. Yeah, I love that. And Hypothesis offers a lot of continuing education. <laughs> if you're interested in Hypothesis, they have Hypothesis Academy, right. which um, allows you to learn ways in which you can use this in your class beyond just the obvious that we're talking about today. And you get a badge. Everybody wants a badge. Oh, yeah. I got, I got one. I got one. Uh, and I'm going to cover that. I've got a slide on that, too, as we, as we wrap up. Is there anything else, then? I'm going to finish I out. I just have one oh, other yep, thing to yep. say. I, I I used the video tool for the first time this semester. That was really exciting. And I've always shown my students the crash course videos on media, media literacy. Only this time I had them annotated. And this time I had a student who contacted me uh, directly. And she said, I just want to thank you so much for giving us this material and asking us to really engage in it. Because I thought I knew what I was doing when I was engaging in media online. And I realized now that I really did not. And now I feel way better prepared because I've had this opportunity to kind of check in with it in a deeper way. Okay, that just gave me like goosebumps. I'm like kidding. That's what you want. <laughs> I love it, I love it. You would think we've been, we've both been doing this for so long that we wouldn't get excited about stuff. But I, every day I, I like, I must love what I do because I do get excited. <laughs> Well, it's when you get that one, that is, that is, uh, that's that is worth the, everything. The yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, anything else, Karen, we're going to finish out so we can let everybody go with the PowerPoint. Um, just to, I mean, Lynn has mentioned a lot of the things we're probably going to talk about, but, um, the support, is there anything else coming up? No, no questions. That was amazing. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, it was. Thank you. So as Lynn mentioned, she was great. She was a, a great commercial for the pedagogical support. So again, in my opinion, or my experience, the implementation is not, is, is minimal. It's not a heavy lift. I mean, you're just using an external tool over assignments you're already using in your um, Canvas courses. But pedagogically, I feel like you really do need to figure out pedagogically, like what, what's my goal? What do I want students to do? It could be based on the content, the course, whatever it is. And that's where we have some help uh, with your customer success team. One of our managers is 
uh, a previous instructional designer from Rutgers and also uh, teaches an asynchronous course online using Hypothesis. And so she's definitely experienced uh, now and very helpful for what you might need. She can do customized work webinars. Also, we have workshops that cover topics like social annotation, the age of AI, you know, UDL, JSTOR, Vital Source, just um, all kinds of things to help you sort of figure out pedagogically how you would want to use the tool. Um, sample assignments, I mentioned all of that and tech support. So definitely great opportunities. And as Lynn mentioned, Hypothesis Academy, it's a two week asynchronous course, probably takes about three to five hours of your time, but you actually will create an assignment, whether it's uh, just social annotation or if it's something to do with AI, that when you're finished, you've, you've got, you know, you've got something you can use. And you also can connect with other educators uh, in the Slack channel and share you know, share resources, share information. Um, this is our pricing option, which there might this might not be uh, important to some people on the call, but we do have the College Buys RFP, so certainly we can do a per user agreement or an enterprise sort of campus wide, um, and both of those are discounted. So that's all I have. Um, I, if you want to reach out to me with questions or send someone else to me, I'm easily at Gina at hypothesis.com. I'd be happy to talk to you guys. And uh, we really do appreciate your time. And thanks, Lynn, again, for your uh, feedback and sharing. And thank you, everybody else who joined. We'll have this recording. We'll send it to the uh, FCCC people. And hopefully they'll have that as a resource for anybody that couldn't make it today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Gina. Right, Thank you, Carl. Thanks.